him, 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 him. I said, do not do that. <laughs> Don't do it again. Uh... Okay. <clears throat> You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. <clears throat> and now here's your host, <coughs> Rish Outfield <sighs> and Big Anklevich. <clears throat> oh, man. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. I have nothing to say. And that's Rish Outfield with nothing to say. Rish Outfield is... Wait, what, what is this episode? This episode is episode number 145. That is all I will contribute to today's episode, besides mispronouncing contribute. Okay, that sounds good. Um, and pointing out that we have a special guest in the studio, the ever-barking dog. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if anybody can hear it or not. It's hard to say when you're recording what background noise actually shows up and what doesn't. Should I close the door, you think? I think it adds to the ambience and gives me something to talk about other than the story. Okay, good. Well, then we'll just leave it. The ever-barking dog is the guest near the studio today. That's right. He won that contest of be a guest in a, a, a Dune Steve episode no one will listen to. That uh, <laughs> We actually only had two entrants. Yeah. The other one was the ever-hissing cat. And you know which one we choose. <laughs> Anyways... Uh, today's story is the final episode of the Dune Steve. Oh, thank <laughs> the final. Thank Steve Ely, really. B M S E. You thought I was just going to stop at B M, right. didn't you? This story really puts the B M <laughs> in B M S E. That's right. This is the final of our four Broken Mirror story contest winners. Our story is called The Calling. And you were going, you were about to say that it is the BMSiest of the. <laughs> That's right. It is the BMSiest of the BMSEs, the final Broken Mirror story entrant. And, uh, we're lucky to get it out at all, as you can tell by Rish Outfield's pissy and moany attitude. Or he says other people. Yes, but I'm much more moany than pissy. Maybe. We'll have to see. The dog apparently disagrees. Yeah, I don't think the dog agrees with you. He says, no, Moni, pissy. Don't you two have anything better to do? So anyways, yeah, uh, that's our story today. The author. And now a word about the author. Rish Outfield is sitting across the table from me. Wait, did you tell him it was me? Let's not tell him who the author is. Okay, we won't tell him. Okay. On with the story. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. Cooper, no, you did. Never mind. Oh, now the dog goes quiet. The Calling by Rish Outfield Joshua! A female voice called. I started to turn, and in that one second... A multitude of things happened. First, I knew I recognized the person who was saying my name. Second, I was a teenage boy again, with all the feelings and confusions and frustrations of that age. Back in Montana, with the long, dark winters, and so many bad memories. It was my sister calling my name there in the Beverly Center Mall. January, my twin sister. Before I made eye contact, it was 16 years ago the last time I had seen her. The argument, the fury in her face, that righteous indignation that was so hated and so familiar. A decade and a half ago, and suddenly the pain and doubt and regret was back. That almost buried longing. And that sense of betrayal. January's face was unreadable. She was a woman now, thirty-something. Taller, thinner, dressed in a nondescript, shapeless sweatshirt and khaki jeans. She now wore glasses, but she was still my sister. The set of her mouth was as familiar to me as my own reflection. After all, I saw it in every mirror I looked into. Once, she had been my closest friend and confidant. She had come to me with every problem and every worry, as well as her many accomplishments and hopes. 
I'd ask how she felt about something and, based on her answer, would decide how I felt about it. We had discovered life together until we had gone our separate ways. Or rather, until I went my separate way, leaving her to fend for herself. I'd left her in that crazy, hopelessly inside-out family with mom and dad and the aunts and uncles and nana and cousins and the strangers that called themselves uncles and the goddamn calling. I stood there, frozen for a moment, half in and half outside of the mall pet store where I'd been looking for a birthday present for Chase, a hamster or gerbil or kangaroo rat or something. My sister started walking toward me, a smile on her face, apparently not also thinking about the last time she spoke with me. I found myself smiling, too. Maybe she had broken away. Maybe she was free of the calling and had moved to California and was looking for a brother again. I started toward her, too, and when we met, through the motion of Wednesday shoppers, we embraced. Hey, little brother, she exclaimed, holding me tight. And it was tight. She didn't have an ounce of fat on her, and by the feel of her arms, she was all muscle. It made me feel a bit self-conscious about my little love handles. Apparently, the naturally competitive spirit between siblings is hard to shake. January, how have you been? What are you doing here? I'm fine. Great to see you. She shook her head, still smiling. You've gotten so fat. <laughs> Some things never changed. I, I guess. Not you, though. You look good. Thank you. How are you, Joshua? It's just Josh, I said automatically. I'd always hated the long version of my name mostly because of the old days in my parents' house. What brings you to town, Jan? You live here now? Oh, no, just passing through. It's an interesting story, though. Might you be up for some dinner? Before I could answer, she patted my belly and said, Of course you're up to it. What am I saying? I'm not exactly Uncle Crawford, Jan. Crawford McGinty had been nearly 400 pounds when he died, or at least he seemed like it to nine-year-old January and me. Well, not yet, <laughs> January said, then grinned big to show me she meant it in jest. Her smile looked odd. There was too much gum showing, and I wondered if she might be ill, if that's what this was about. Do you want to go to the food court? They have some really good empanadas at one of the... Sure, that's fine, she said, watching a trio of teenage girls walk by. They were being loud and obnoxious, of course, but January observed them with suspicion I recognized, even though I hadn't seen it in years. My family had been very religious, the whole extended family was, and had pounded it into our heads from the beginning that the McGintys were special and above the dregs of normal, worldly society, because of the sacred calling. God Almighty had smiled upon the members of our family and given each of us the chance to be serial murderers. Lucky us. I sat down in an awkward plastic chair across a little plastic table, looking at my sister for the first time in over a decade. I'd been 16 then, we both were, and the pitiable, sad expression of her last look had haunted me all these many years. I'd been unworthy of the calling, unworthy of the McGinty family. Well, I wasn't a McGinty anymore. My name was now Josh Spencer, since Spencer had been my middle name, and my children were Spencers too. The name had been legally changed in 2003, and it seldom came up anymore. I didn't talk about my past, and my ex-wife was the only person who knew about the calling. I probably shouldn't have told even her, but back then, I had thought we'd be together forever. True love blooms eternal. No secrets necessary. You know the drill. Part of me was so happy to see my sister. Maybe she had also made her escape. Maybe we could be a family again, a real family with no talk of changelings or auras or demons or sacred bloodshed. Maybe. Ours had been an unusual childhood. Out there in rural Montana, we had literally no neighbors that were not related to us, 
and from a very young age, we were taught that our family was among the elect, put here by a divine creator to protect our more ignorant, uninformed brothers from that which was decidedly not divine. Beings walked among us in human guise, undoing the works of God Almighty and man, killing and kidnapping and influencing the elite and those with mere potential, crafting the darkest futures for our little world. Usurpers, the elders often called them, but my immediate family seemed to prefer the word changelings. One day a man or woman was perfectly fine, innocent, and dear, and the next day something else controlled that body, something that only those who were chosen could detect. The sacred calling was, to put it bluntly, the faculty to recognize and kill these changelings where they appeared. The first time I saw the dead body of one of those allegedly tainted humans, I was four years old. It's one of my earliest memories. Spit on it, Grandpa Gregor told me. I didn't understand, despite having it inculcated to me daily, because the dead woman I saw in the woods where my Uncle Jamin and cousins had taken her looked not like a hideous beast or clutching ravenous spirit, but like a dirty sleeping lady. I spat, but the saliva only got on my shirt, and I found myself consumed with wiping it clean, starting to cry and wanting to go home. I saw the changelings as others saw them, as outsiders saw them. But one day, if I pleased God Almighty, that would change. At least, my parents said so. They both heard the voice of God telling them where to look, where to go, and who to pinpoint. But Nana Esther and Uncle Fredrickson could actually see them as the changelings truly were. Some among the McGintys could sense an aura of evil or golden haze following fellow humans. A couple of the cousins could smell brimstone as if the taint of hell still clung to the changeling's clothing. My great-grandfather, apparently, had both seen and heard, I was told, and by the end of his life, at the ripe old age of forty-one, he could empower others to see and hear the voice of God. At first, I believed it all, quite willingly— I wanted to be called, longed to do my part. January and I went along to the meetings and occasionally to the cleansing services, which was what the family called the murders. We were callow observers, and we did as we were told. My father was not an affectionate man. His upbringing had been stern and disciplined, and he felt that was the best way to proceed. But in the flurry of activity that surrounded a hunt or disposal— He would gather me in his arms and hold me close, or better yet, hoist me onto his shoulders and carry me aloft like a giant or a king, the smell of vitalis he applied to his dark hair strong in my childish nose. January, however, was less attended to, and would clamor for his affection, hoping that one day it would be her turn. As a babe, I was proud and fiercely vain that I was Daddy's favorite, but as the years progressed and I grew closer to my twin— and further from my parents, I noticed the slights, shared the tears, and hoped that things would change. Mom explained that I was the heir and would carry on the family name even though January was older than me by nearly an hour. It was January who first voiced doubt to me that ours was a true calling. If angels and demons were truly among us, then why did the elders and various family members argue about God Almighty's will and each other's actions? If only the righteous of God's children were blessed with voice or sight, then why did Uncle Mortimer, who cussed and chawed and fought with people at family functions, hear the voices directing him to changelings? And when Cousin Belinda's baby daughter had to be drowned because a changeling had taken its place, why had she not heard the warnings? And why did she scream and cry and try to stop Daddy and Grandpa Gregor from taking the baby? Old Ricky Smithson had been burned alive the previous time January had gone on a cleansing service. But a week before, she'd heard Nana complaining not that he looked like a monster, but about Ricky's drinking and how embarrassed the community was about it. My mind went back to the dead lady in the woods. If a changeling was a demon that killed a person and took them over, then why hadn't she looked like someone who'd been dead for the weeks since the usurper had murdered her? 
I was ten years old the last time I went along on a hunt. Mom and Dad and Uncle Jamin and Aunt Jacqueline had gone to an apartment building to get a handyman. Initially, I understood it as a candy man, named Martinez. He'd been walking out just as we'd gone in, and everybody in the party, except for me, had turned as one, seeing a devil among us. Martinez had ran, and we pursued. The more athletic members of the family left the rest of us behind, and when my mother, cousin Carl, and I caught up, the handyman had taken refuge in an unfinished warehouse, a maze of wood and beams and cables and construction equipment. They'd already found him when we got there, and he was huffing and babbling in Spanish, crying when he saw the bat Daddy was holding. Sometimes the family members used a gun, but in a place where the shots could draw attention, they went with something quieter. With the racket the changeling was currently making, though, maybe a gun would have been better. I didn't understand a word of Spanish at that age, but I understood the tone. And this guy didn't sound like the monstrous hellspawn our community elders had preached about. In fact, it was the first time I'd seen a grown man crying, and something shifted inside me. Mom? I began, letting go of her hand. The Hispanic man looked around at everyone and switched to English. I, I, I don't do anything. Please, not doing this. Please. I took a step back. Mommy? Just ignore it, Joshua. She told me. It's not a man anymore. But it was, and he was terrified. He looked, pleading from face to face, and for one brief, terrible moment, his eyes met mine. Mom? I whimpered, and then Uncle Jamin's arm swung a board down on the man's head. It made a wet, soft sound, like an apple falling from a tree. My father and Aunt Jacqueline also struck at the man, one with a baseball bat, the other with a long brown pipe I later understood to be rebar. I turned away, but I heard the continued pounding, the grunts, and a noise from my father that sounded like an amused snort. Work of God indeed. I was changed that evening. My doubts, and they had been many, solidified, and I closed my mind completely to any more preaching, any more faith, any more hope that what my family believed was true. I seldom went to sermons anymore, and I never again went on a hunt or a cleansing service. January tried to reason with me at first. The devil has got to be really smart, she suggested. Or he wouldn't be the devil. But she hadn't been there, hadn't seen that man, a normal, ordinary man, murdered in cold blood. She had seen cleansings before, she said, and the people acted crazed and violent and sometimes spoke in strange, confusing voices. In her estimation, these other victims had certainly been changelings. But if the man I'd seen killed in the warehouse was not one of them, then that meant the family was fallible. It meant you could never be sure. And eventually, January came over to my side, questioning things more seriously, doubting it all as well. By the time she was twelve, she too refused to go on hunts, and some Saturday evenings she stayed home with me, playing games or swapping homework assignments, instead of attending community services. That brought us closer, even though it angered my father and hurt my mother. I was a godless boy, according to Dad, and a corrupting influence on those around me. Mom, however, insisted that one day, if I opened myself up to it, God Almighty would call me, and I would see or hear the truth. January, I remembered, once got it in her head that there was a fatal flaw in the family's belief system. If only McGinty's were chosen, then why did our mother hear the voice, or claim to, anyway? To her horror, she then learned that Mom was Dad's first cousin, and not just a McGinty by marriage. That closed that line of inquiry right quick. January sat down across from me, her tray of Chinese food steaming. She mumbled something, and I started to ask her to speak up, then stopped myself. She was blessing the food. I slowly and deliberately arranged my plastic utensils and salted my green beans. Just as I took a bite of my pasta, 
My sister came out of her reverie. So I hear you're a gardener? I shrugged. Sort of. Like a florist or something? I nodded. I work at the Universal Greenery. You know, Universal Studios? They have trees and plants and flowers that get used in various productions. Interesting, she said, though I got the impression that she didn't really think so. I'd come to California a dozen years back with very little experience or education, and now I owned my own home. Well, condo. So I didn't think I'd done too badly. Some would even think my work was glamorous, though I'd never been in the movies myself or even had my name in the credits of one. What about you, Jan? Are you married? Kids? No, not anymore, she said, focusing on her plate. Oh, I'm sorry. I glanced at her left hand. No ring. I got divorced two years ago. Uh, three, she said. She wrapped some noodles around a fork. At least that's what I heard. Oh, I thought about it. It was just past three years since I'd split with my wife. Not so painful anymore, though. Did you tell me what brings you to L.A.? And two children, a boy and a girl, January said, again seeming only to pretend to be interested. Yeah. Chase and Talia, she told me. Right. Do they live with you? I leaned forward. Do you already know, Jan? Just making conversation. No, they're with me two weekends a month. Sometimes more often, but usually they're with their mother. In Culver City. Word gets around. I took a sip of my water and chewed the ice. What about you, Jan? Divorced? McGinty's don't get divorced, she recited. Further proof that I'm not one of you. You shouldn't have changed your name, Joshua. If Daddy had lived to hear about... He didn't? Didn't he only die when? Five years back? 2007, she said, her voice patient and emotionless. We missed you at the funeral, Mom especially. I could say nothing to that. I might have made it back to Montana with a little effort, but I would never go back, even if it made me look like a cold bastard not to. How is Mom? I asked. She is frail, too thin, tired more often than not, but she walks with the shepherd. That was a particularly annoying family saying, bringing to mind angelic throngs and clouds and rainbow staircases. It meant that whatever was asked of her, she did God Almighty's will, and her salvation was assured. That would definitely keep the weight off. I said, not hiding the bitterness I was once again feeling. I pushed another mouthful of pasta in, but it had no taste. You should call her, my sister said. Pretend that you still care. She'd see through that, I said. I seem to remember the family having a thing or two to say about hypocrites. Jan put down her fork. You never heard the voice, Josh? Never? Suddenly I was sixteen again. The last time I'd seen my twin, the final exchange between us, the straw that broke that old camel's back. Why are you here, January? I asked, that odd name awkward on my lips. I hear the voice, Joshua, and it brought me here. To you. My mouth suddenly went dry, and I had no more appetite. When January burst in, the delight on her face told me exactly what I needed to know. Alex Cardston had asked her if she'd go to the prom with him. I was proud of my friend. Even though McGinty's were forbidden to go on dates with other high schoolers, since they were worldly and sinful and incorrectly taught, January and I had discussed it, and since we didn't believe a word of what our parents told us anymore, we'd agreed that dating was fair game. I'd even kissed Deanna Reinar after a soccer win earlier that spring. Alex was a good guy, and I thought he was January's type, so I told him to man up and go for it. But I was wrong. Joshua, you'll never believe what happened to me. I think I would. Alex Cardston, right? This gave her pause. Who? What happened to Alex Cardston? He... Uh, nothing, I said. What happened, Jan? I... She began, then looked around the room. 
She was positively beaming, and I thought she might start crying any second now. Where's Mom? (laughs) She's at Aunt Gretchen's. They're baking some kind of... It happened, Joshua! Jan interrupted. It finally happened to me! I didn't know what she was talking about, but my mind instantly went to the taste of Deanna Reinar's mouth on that windy night on the bleachers. Maybe Jan had had her first kiss, too. What did? I heard the voice. I was in the bathroom at school, and I thought it might have been someone else in a stall or something. But then it spoke again. It said my name, and I knew the voice was coming from inside me, not anyone else around. The voice? I asked, and the words came out in a kind of semi-whisper. My mind may not have entirely understood what she was saying, but my throat apparently did. The voice of God Almighty! She was exultant. It told me I had been chosen, that the sacred calling was mine, a chance to be the arms of God, to purge his earth of the changelings that would seek to destroy his great works. I swallowed. I had heard all of this before, a hundred times, on Tuesday meetings, growing up, and every single Saturday night and Sunday morning at the converted barn Grandpa Gregor had preached in. Uncle Fredrickson had even used those same words to promise a nine-year-old me that if I was righteous enough, I too could be chosen and get a gift of God for myself. It spoke to me, she continued. It called me by name. It said, he said, that I could start my life anew and fulfill the promise of my birth. What promise of your birth? What the hell does that mean? No blaspheming, Joshua, January said, in a pitch-perfect impression of our mother. Now that— How is hell blasphemy? I asked, teeth starting to grind. And I've heard you say everything from shit to motherfuck just for fun, just because you could. I was wrong, she said, lowering her head. No, you weren't. No lightning bolts came from the sky, did they? Even if you actually did blaspheme— We don't believe in lightning bolts, little brother. Except, I guess, we get to be the bolts, don't we? This was some kind of epiphany for her, a realization that she could now shed blood without any fear of eternal reprisals. Then I got it. Oh, I see what this is. I shook my head, disgusted. Apparently, whatever expression was on my face shocked her, though it was her turn for a nasty shock, wasn't it? Don't look at me like that, Joshua. What do you think this is? You figured out a way for Mom and Dad to like you best, to pick you as the better of her two fucked-up children. Language! She exclaimed. And I don't know what you're talking about. It was us against them for, what, five years now? Us against them, you and me. Don't do this! I'm not doing anything. Our Father who art in heaven is doing it. Father who is in heaven, I corrected. And he's got nothing to do with it. You didn't hear any voices. You just thought that if you told Dad you did, then everything would be great again. Or great for once, since it was always fucked up in this house ever since— Stop talking like that, Joshua! She shouted, and tears sprang to her eyes. Always— I repeated, but it didn't matter because you and me had each other. I had your back and you had mine. Pray with me, Joshua, she said. Pray that you hear the voice, too. Then we can shut up about the goddamn voice, Jan. There's no voice. You know there isn't. You fucking know it. She was crying in earnest now. I heard it, Joshua. No. I hear it now. What? Come on. I was getting less disgusted and more angry. Is it telling you that I'm not your brother anymore? That you have to kill me? No, it's telling me to to leave you alone. That your time will come. If you only open your heart to the- Shut up! I shouted. You might be able to fool mom and dad, but not me. Me and you were the same egg or sperm or however that works. I know you're not hearing any voices. Tell me the truth, Jan, please. I am telling you the truth. They're real. Bullshit. 
She wiped her eyes and glanced up at the ceiling. If the voice is real, then all of it is. That means the changelings are out there, that the devil is preparing his army on the earth. And God Almighty is... I've heard the sermon. I don't want to hear it again, especially from you. Joshua. She said, looking me in the eye. She squared her shoulders and forced the tears from her voice. I want you on my side on this. When I tell... Do not say that if I'm not with you, I'm against you, I growled. Jan, if you say that, I will punch you in the face. She blinked. I don't know if I truly meant it or not, but she sure thought I meant it. Go to your room, Joshua, and ask God Almighty for guidance on this. No. Do it and he'll answer. You'll see. I won't do it. It's not a game you're playing here. Scotty and the cousins killed an old man a couple of weeks ago over this bullshit. I didn't say anything to you because I didn't want to up- It wasn't a man anymore. It was a changeling. Oh, shut up! Don't keep up this crazy talk! It's not crazy. My head was starting to throb and I could feel the blood rushing to it. Stop it right now, January. I mean it. I will leave. If you don't stop it right now, I won't live here anymore. She cocked her head pretending to be dictated to by angels. Maybe you should leave. Fuck you, I said, and headed to my room. It was the last thing I said to my sister. By the time Dad got home from work, I was gone. I didn't want to be here for the ticker tape parade pronouncing January as special, as a real McGinty. I thought I'd break down and go back after a day or two. But I didn't. I never went back. My big sister was the real draw, the main thing that made that house a home for me. And if she was gone, in everything but name, then I had nothing to go back to. In the food court at the Beverly Center, I picked up my napkin and wiped my mouth with it. My sister seemed to be waiting for a response from me. There are a lot of deluded people in L.A., Jan. I said finally, keeping my voice soft and even. Actors, studio execs, Scientologists, the homeless. But they've got nothing on a family that... It's real, Joshua. Everything they ever taught you. I kept on a bit louder. A family that thinks it's directed by God to terrorize and kill. Changelings are here. In this city, Joshua. They... Yeah, they're on the Disney Channel. Tally is always watching. Do not irreverentiate God's work. She hissed. The voice told me to come here. It led me to you. No, I said, putting up my hand. In a city of millions, I found you in a few hours. January, I said, gritting my teeth. She stopped talking. I'm not dad. You don't have to talk about God's voice or gold auras or callings. If you wanted to see me because you're my sister... Joshua, listen to me. No, I said as quietly as possible. All of that bullshit means nothing to me. It's not bullshit, she snapped, and I could see it stung her to say the word. I heard the voice that day when I was 16, and then... No, Jan, I interrupted. I still hear it, and you're the only person in California I care about, so that means... Save your caring for your victims, sister. So that means that you are in danger. From smog, maybe, not from demons. She blinked giving me a measuring look. Maybe she wondered if the smog thing was a joke, which it was, though a lame one. Maybe she was trying to read me, find an angle that would work. The changelings are real. They can be anyone. They... I stood up. One of my knees hit the food court table with a sharp knock. Around us, a couple of people were glancing over, but most were too wrapped up in cell phone conversations or their own meals. What? Am I a changeling all of a sudden? I'm the same guy I've always been. You're the one who changed. She stood, too. No, you're still you, but... I left the tray where it was. Go back to Montana. It's where you belong. And I walked away, out of the food court and eventually out of the mall. I went back to my little condo, checking the locks to make sure she hadn't been there looking for me. I'd planned to stop by Ralph's and buy some cereal and milk for the kids that weekend. But instead... I just went to sleep.
Friday after work, I met Kirsty at the Toys R Us parking lot on Washington and picked up Talia and Chase. Usually, I hate meeting my ex there since the kids invariably demanded to go into the toy store and look at the overpriced junk, but this time they gave me a break. My reunion with my sister had soured my mood for most of the last couple days, but now that I had my kids with me, I was finally getting over it. Chase was four and flawlessly loyal, always hugging me and wanting to be carried or thrown in the air, but Talia was seven and could be temperamental. She sometimes preferred my company to her mother's, but sometimes complained without end about having to be at my boring old house instead of her own. I lived in a little two-story condominium in Studio City, and both children had rooms upstairs that were ostensibly theirs. Because of my job at Universal, we often went to the movies on the lot when I tended the kids, but the feature they were showing this Friday was a violent crime flick, so we went out for pizza and played memory for an hour before I put them to bed. Usually, Talia would demand a story, and Chase would snooze through it, but on this particular night, she was still angry with me, because she simply said, Good night and went to her room and closed the door. I stood in the hall, my son in my arms, and considered going in and talking to her, maybe insisting on tucking her in despite her attitude. But what would I say to her? My family life was a disaster of biblical proportions, so I need to kiss you goodnight so I don't feel like a terrible father? Instead, I took Chase to his room, turned on his nightlight, and tucked him into the little bed. He made a small sound, but didn't wake up. Good night, champ. I said, turning to leave, then stopped and watched him for a minute. Seeing my sister again had done something to me, given me pause, made me appreciate what I still had all the more. The boy slept peacefully, not aware that they were religious crazies out there, happy to kill those they found different, or pick at the funerals of servicemen, or fly planes into office buildings. I envied him that. It took me a little while to fall asleep that night, I had looked into my sister's eyes two days before and seen a true believer. I had always kept in the back of my mind the surety that January had pretended to hear voices, pretended to be touched by God, so Mom and Dad would fully embrace her as a righteous, favored member of the family. It was easier, more acceptable to me, to conclude she'd been lying. But she really believed it really thought it was true, that demons killed those people, replicated them, and had to be killed in turn by our family and people like us. Staring at the ceiling in my bed for the briefest of moments, I wondered if I might have been wrong all those years, and the McGinties were actually supernaturally gifted. Once I thought of it, a flood of awful ideas came pouring in. If it was real, then why hadn't I ever seen monsters or heard voices? What was wrong with me? Was I damned or despised of God or just plain ordinary? Why had January been picked and not me? Eventually I must have fallen asleep because I was awakened by the ringing of my telephone on the dresser by the TV. It stopped ringing as it went to voicemail and I closed my eyes again. A moment later the phone rang a second time. It was 2.27. I sat up as quickly as I could crossed the room, stumbling over my shoes, and picked up the phone. Hello? There was only silence on the other end. I could hear a car alarm somewhere outside, but no one on the phone with me. Hello? Anybody there? Then I heard a breath, a deep female breath. My sister was on the other end of the line. January? I said. The breath came again, and then a single word. Cottontail. What? I could hear the breathing, and then a click. She had hung up. I considered dialing her back, demanding an explanation, or screaming at her for bothering me at night, but I stood in the dark instead, puzzled and groggy. It had been January's voice, but she said it in such a low, ominous tone, like it was supposed to mean something to me, some kind of password to tell me the secret mission was a go. Cottontail, I said. And then I remembered. Just a few years ago when Kirsty and I had been happy, Cottontail was our nickname for Talia. Talia. I bolted out of my room, turning on lights as I ran through the living room, up the stairs and into the hall. 
I burst into Talia's room, expecting to see God knows what, but terrified I was too late. I was more surprised to find Talia's reading lamp on, and the girl awake and out of bed, kneeling on the floor with her Barbies, chatting with them in her pajamas. She calmly looked up and over at me. Hello. <sighs> Talia, are you okay? What are you doing up? Things, she said, displaying my many dolls. She was all right for now. What woke you up? I asked. Have you heard anything? Oh, what's that smell? It was a foul, bitter stink, the odor of rotten eggs coming from somewhere nearby. Sulfur. What smell, Daddy? My daughter asked. I walked over beside her. She seemed so calm that I too felt I had to be calm so as not to frighten her. The smell was strong in the room and I wondered if she had been sick. Honey, are you okay? Do you smell that? I'm fine. Go back to bed. No, I, I just had to check on you, I said, feeling confused and dizzy. I can see too much of you in those shorts, she told me. A very strange thing to say, but... No, they didn't leave much to the imagination. Sorry. You really should go back to sleep, Joshua, my daughter said. And rather than getting used to it, the awful smell seemed to be intensifying. What? I asked, distracted. Elsewhere in the house, I heard a thump or a thud or a muffled crash. My breath caught in my throat. I couldn't tell if it was upstairs or downstairs. Talia, I think... Then I noticed her dolls. They were all dismembered, the arms and legs missing, the stumps torn and arranged in a pattern I couldn't fathom. And the parts weren't just pulled off. They had been chopped off, sliced or slit as if with a knife or a... My daughter reached under the bed and pulled out a meat cleaver. She held it in both hands and rose to her knees. You really ought to have gone back to bed, Joshua McGinty. I stumbled backward. Talia stood up, swiveling to face me, and, even though it was my child's face, there was a blank, dead expression on it, like somebody sleepwalking or in a trance. She took a step toward me. Talia, I muttered, backing away. I heard another thump elsewhere in the house, and my daughter still stepped toward me. Don't play with that, honey, I said, but it was useless. This person wasn't playing. She wasn't even Talia. Joshua! A voice called from the hall. I glanced in that direction, and it was then that the child made her attack. She ran at me with the cleaver raised, her little teeth gritted, and a figure grabbed me from behind, pulled me out of the way, and kicked in Talia's direction. January's thick army surplus boot made contact with my seven-year-old's chest, and the child flew back toward the bed. The meat cleaver clattered against the bookshelf, gouging a line in it where the blade struck. January was dressed all in black, like an assassin in a movie, with a sweater and thin gloves, her hair tied back, and a pistol and holster under her arm. She put one hand up in greeting, and removed the gun with the other. It had a funny black tube on the end. A silencer. Best go now, Joshua, she said quietly, calmly. Take your little boy and leave the house. Don't look back. What? What are you going to do? It's not your daughter, Josh. I know you don't believe me, but... No, no, I interrupted. I believe you. How could I not after what I had just experienced? Talia stood up again, not crying, not injured. She looked around the room for an escape route. It was not the actions of a regular child. Joshua, my sister said solidly. She sounded like my father, giving an order he expected to be obeyed. I glanced once more at Talia, and then she put her stubby arms out toward me, a pleading expression appearing on her round face. Daddy? My stomach clenched. I knew what I was looking at was not my little girl. I knew it. But still, my own arms started to raise on their own, out of habit or instinct. Joshua! January shouted. You don't want to see this! Take your boy and go. I forced myself to look away from the changeling and left the bedroom. January closed the door behind me. In the hall, I saw Chase's bedroom door open. Daddy? He asked, and I quickly moved toward him, eager to be away from the room when my sister started shooting. We gotta go, 
I said, scooping the boy into my arms as I went. He held his teddy bear close, and I could feel he had wet the bed, but no matter. I carried him through the hall and toward the stairs. I heard a sound, the high-pitched, thwooping sound from countless spy movies, and knew that it was the silenced pistol firing. I stumbled on the stairs and had to stop or we'd both fall. What was that sound? Chase asked. I don't, I said, but it was all I could say. The realization came flooding in. My sister had just shot my firstborn child dead. No, I thought aloud. Talia was already dead. That creature had been one of the changelings. It was all true, everything my family had preached and done. The sacred calling. I was a part of it. I had smelled that stink. Sulfur. Brimstone. I smelled it still. Daddy! Chase demanded. What? I asked him, starting down the stairs again. Where are you taking me? I don't know, I said, my mind a flutter of activity. Who are you talking to? I didn't answer. Across the room I could see the front door standing open, a big chunk missing where the deadbolt used to be. Chase pushed against me, pulling his teddy bear out from between us. I was still smelling brimstone. It was coming from him. The boy reached into the bear and pulled something from inside. It was a paring knife, one from the kitchen. Chase, I said. And then he plunged it into my eye. Author's note. <laughs> You're kidding me. Okay, welcome back, everybody. I know you enjoyed the story today. I won't even say I hope you enjoyed it. I know. Not me. I was squirming the whole time. Yeah, well, you do that anyways, though. It's just your twitchy way. I think Big is right. Uh, so, cast list for today's story. We had... Let's see. Dave Robison, made famous by the fabulously wildly popular Roundtable podcast, was the narrator. Julie Hoverson for the also fabulously, wildly, famously, outstandingly popular <laughs> 19 Nocturne Boulevard podcast was the uh, sister whose name was January, I believe, which is... Ugh, who would name their kid January anyway? I mean, come on. You named your kid Ja... I mean... And uh, the rest of the cast was played by Rish and I and some of the children. Think of the children. Have you checked the children? <laughs> Have you checked the children? You need to write another one of those. <laughs> yeah, I should have written the first one, maybe. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's our cast list. So, Rish Outfield... We meet again. There's those three questions that everybody has to answer... That goes along. Air the other side they see. That's right. I'm going to look them up right now and force you to answer them. This is not going to be pleasant, folks. What episode of the Dune Steve is, after all? Well, there was that one you did without me. <laughs> no, that one was much more unpleasant. Me and 08 OT didn't get along. What did you think of the story, announcer man? That sucked. <laughs> okay. I, I'm, I have a feeling he's not going to be alone in that... Uh, <laughs> Regard. That could have been good, but it sure wasn't. <laughs> okay, I found the three questions. The questions three that you must answer me. Question number the other side, you <laughs> see. Question number one. Yes, but bigger. Okay. Let me see if we can get question number two out. <laughs> question number two. Uh. Huh, that that's a better question. <laughs> Um, <laughs> not really, no. Okay, okay. Question number three. <laughs> Ooh, I might have to get back to you on that one. That's, that's a, nobody has ever posed it quite like that. That's right. To me. <laughs> there. Okay, that's, that's more like, yes, always. Uh, Asian women. <laughs> Whoa. Well, you, 
ask. I mean, they always ask. <laughs> the Parsec nominated Dune Steve team, folks. <laughs> okay, question number one. How much of this story, Senor Rish Outfield, came from the prompt that Rish and Big gave? And how much came from a previous story idea that you had already thought of in the past and you just shoehorned this thing in? Does it actually say shoehorned? No. Oh. I'm just kind of... I, you know, I don't know that I want to answer these questions because I would love to hear other people answer them. We already did. But I don't give a crap about my own answer. Um, all of it came from the prompt. I usually give these a lot of thought and I'll come up with various ideas and say, well, what if this or what if that? And remind the audience what the prompt was. We should have done oh, that. Oh, yeah, we again. probably should have before uh, we played the story, but it's too late now. Yeah, the prompt was a child is proclaimed king. And everybody is exactly the same. The end. Terrible. No, gosh, what was it? Um, the phone rings in the middle of the night. The voice on the other end of the line only says one word. And that word is enough. Okay, so what was I saying? So why didn't you use the word enough anyways? I'm sure I used the word in there. It's a long story. It's got every word in there, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, it does. Every word. Oh, okay. So what I was saying was, I, you know, usually I will, I will come up with as many possibilities as I can. And I, I thought about the word and I thought about, you know, whose phone might ring in the middle of the night, whether that's going to be a scary phone call, whether it's going to be a funny phone call, whether it's going to be a call to adventure kind of phone call. And I was really struggling. And uh, this was the one where we had over a month, I think, to do the story. Or, yeah, or, yeah or, I think or, it was like six weeks. And I was worried I had come up with a story that I thought was funny, uh, where it's just, you know, uh, the punchline is, is what's on the phone kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I started to write that and then I ended up throwing it out. Uh, and so uh, where most of my ideas come from is not when I'm sitting in front of a computer or a notebook. It's when I'm doing something else, when you're mowing the lawn when you're going for a bike ride, when you're murdering a hobo. Yeah. But right. I know what you're talking yeah. about. When you're fulfilling your husbandly <laughs> duties. And in this case, I was driving to my cousin's house. Uh, I go to his house every other Tuesday and I just turned off the radio because you know, the radio sometimes will interrupt. Yeah. And, and would Plays just endless commercials. <laughs> it does. And I just, I, I had it completely silent in there and I just said, okay, what can this story be about? What? What does the person say on the phone? Who is the person and all that? And and I came up with an idea I liked. And so I just sort of said it aloud. And then I said, ooh. And it was funny because it was almost as though there was someone else in the car and I was bouncing ideas off of them. And I was like, okay, but what about this? It's like, it oh, like, no, 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 no. Even better. this Because <laughs> originally he had one kid. And it was going to be really subtle that the kid had been possessed. It was going to be his son. But maybe it would be better... If, uh, cause, cause he, the audience was going to realize that the kid was possessed. Then the story was just going to end with like, oh shoot, what's going to happen to the dad or, or the dad dies kind of thing. And I was just like, oh gosh, there's got to be some way I can have my cake and eat it too. And oh, yeah. and then I thought, oh, what if he has two kids and they're both possessed? Cause that way I can have my cake and eat it too. I can have him realize and I can have them kill him. And I was like, oh, that's, that's great. Uh, somewhere along the line, I made the stupid mistake of having it be in first person. So it's being narrated by what? A ghost? <laughs> yeah, those, that's always kind of weird when you have a first person story that ends in that person's death, but whatever. Oh, well, so, so I'm sorry. The, the, it, the, the punchline of that was when I got to my cousin's house, I said, dude, 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 before we play Halo or whatever we normally do, kill hobos. Um, <laughs> I, here's an idea that I had and I want to bounce it off you. And so I told him from beginning to end kind of what the story was and uh, he said, oh, that's pretty cool. What's that from? And I was like, from? It's from me. I made it up. And he's like, oh, well, which is high praise for him. And so I was like, wow, that's cool. He thought I had stolen it from something. <laughs> yeah, you're like, oh, I already bounced it off Smeagol before on the way <laughs> over here. And now I want to try it on, a, on a, not my reflection in the window sitting next to me. Yeah, I said I want to bounce it off one of my friends. And he says, you haven't got any friends. Nobody likes you. <laughs> Okay, question number two. What is your quest? Asian women. <laughs> oh, boy. Back to that. Uh, question number two. How did you decide what the single word spoken over the phone would be? 
Did you start with that word and go from there? Or did you have to shoehorn the phone call into the tail as you were going along? Okay, the, the, yes. This time it really does say shoehorn. It really does say shoehorn. Actually, the whole story came from the word. Because I was just coming up with words. and and, and like Because I, I decided I wanted it to be a scary revelation something like because it was easy to come up with a funny a punchline on the phone and i thought okay what what would be a scary thing and finally it occurred to me what if somebody said your kid's name like you know they're c- coming after your kid or have you checked the children kind of oh were you about to say it coming for your son yes exactly kind of thing and it, but it could only be one word and i thought something was more intimate and it's like well maybe it's his his wife maybe it's his pet name for his wife and then I was like, no, 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 it's his nickname for his kid, something that n- people wouldn't know. And then I was just like, oh, how can I make it explicit that people wouldn't know it kind of thing? And and it, the story sort of built itself from there. It was like, okay, it's somebody that he hasn't seen since this kid has been born. So there's no way they could know that was his nickname for, at this point, his son. And, and so, yeah, the story sort of started to expand from there on both sides, you know, because the, the ending of the story was sort of supposed to be the phone call, you know, the revelation of who the, the ghost or demon or monster or possessed one is or who has been marked for death. You know, I couldn't decide. And so I just built back and back. And then once I decided why they were pointing to the kid, then I had to have an ending after that. Spit on it. Don't go there. <laughs> That was really good. That was really funny announcer, man. <laughs> uh, so yes, the word was the whole. The word was the inception. The word was inception. Wait, I didn't. I, listen, I I didn't hear that at all in there. Wait, wait. Is there? You a... did say that there was every word in the story, though. So okay. maybe I just missed it. What uh, is is there a verb? An inception verb? Incept? Is that a word? Inceptionation or insemination? Yes. Um, <laughs> So yes, the the word ended up being very important, and yeah, the whole the whole shoehorning thing. I didn't think it was fair because to me it was a writing exercise, so it had to be super important to the story. But we, I don't think we made that a prerequisite. Do you wish that we had? No, I don't think so. I know that we. I mean, with our new contest, the triple word score, we made it very much a prerequisite. These words have to be important to the story. In this other, but I think. The judges still took it that way. You know what I mean? Like, there were a lot of people who complained about stories where it wasn't important. I know that, uh, for example, Secret Santa, you know, started with a, the, the call wasn't all that important. Could have been any kind of a thing. And I know that there were people that complained in the comments. Hey, this one doesn't count. It's not right for the contest or whatever. But, uh. But it does have a phone call. It does have a phone call say and a one, one word. word. And so it still fulfilled the letter of the law. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it was that important that it be that way. Uh, it, I, I mean, it's hard not to make it important, though. I mean, it's, I don't know, it's just part of the deal when you do a, a story like that. But I guess Linger's phone call also wasn't really all that important. It wasn't integral to the story. Although I guess, you know, as the author was saying, it still got him thinking about why these people didn't want to say much on the phone. And so it kind of helped him to generate a story of what these people were that were doing that. So in a way it was integral, but it wasn't like necessary to the whole structure of the story or anything. I think they probably could have just started in O'Malley's pub to begin with if he wanted to, and no one would have felt it was missing something. Except for the people that, you know, read for the contest or said, wait a minute, wasn't there supposed to be a phone call with one word in this story? <laughs> you, your story, the whole point was the word, right? Or, well, maybe not the whole point, but that's your non-comedic punchline. Yeah, yeah, it definitely was. Um, my story, I, I can't remember if I said this in our incentive episode that we recorded already, which, by the way, if you want to hear a story that gets a one... You can donate to the show and we'll uh, send it on out to you. That was my entry into the Broken Mirror contest. And uh, yeah, I when I did it, I originally had the idea, you know, A, the call was going to be very important. I wanted it to be, at first it was going to be the inciting incident. I had this idea where, you know, the call was going to be like a code word, a trigger word, I guess, is more the the right term. 
and uh, this person would she answers the phone and then all of a sudden you know she hears that word and she turns into Sydney Bristow and starts you know beating the crap out of whoever it is that she's with was my original idea and then I thought ah, that's a it's my first idea that I came upon which probably means that I've heard it before or seen it before somewhere and b I bet somebody else is probably going to do that too and so I decided I needed to come up with something else and I thought you know what would be more interesting is if the call, instead of being the inciting incident, was the big finale. You know, this is what it all led to was this call. And so I tried to come up with a way for that to be the case instead. And so that's what led me to do what I did in my story. Do you think that maybe someday you'll do the trigger word story? It's possible, but I don't think it likely. You you didn't develop it beyond that? Not really. My idea was something like, this woman who we're supposed we supposedly like you know she's seems vulnerable and et cetera, and she has somehow started dating like the president's son or something like that and then she's going to get the call and turn into you know a berserker killing machine and but that's about as far as i got with it really um, well, uh, uh uh summer glau no what's her name river tam all right that, she had a trigger word and it turned her into some kind of acrobatic yeah, killing butt machine. kicker. Remember what the trigger word was? Something with an M. Miranda. That's it, Miranda. I was like, Monica, am I speaking to Miranda now? <laughs> okay, so we got one more question for you, sir. You are a champion. How does that make you feel? <laughs> you won the Guilty. Rich, you won the Rish Outfield Story Contest. <laughs> I think I told people when this was announced... It's the absolute worst contest I could have won. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was funny. And that's I, uh, that's basically what is behind your reticence to put your story out this time around, isn't it? I mean, because normally you're just like, oh, yeah, my story first. No, out of the way, everybody. You know, you go back to there in line. Me first, me first. Like the little kids, you know, when you're handing out popsicles, you're just pushing all the other kids out of the way. And like we said in the song... <laughs> From last week, you know, reading stories that aren't yours or a bore or whatever it was that you said. But in this case, you feel embarrassed because it was your own contest. Well, it does feel like a cheat to me. But we must explain that it definitely wasn't because the way that the story was judged, the way the contest was judged, is the names of the authors were omitted from the stories. So they were sent to all the readers son's author name and uh yeah the readers just read the story and gave it a a number between one and ten based on how they liked it and so it does feel like a cheat because you are in charge of the contest but there was no way that you could have cheated other than knowing no we didn't even get to give our own stories a number i remember nicole wouldn't allow us to do that so we couldn't even artificially boost our number and so, yeah, we basically could not cheat, except for maybe look at the uh, spreadsheet where all the grades were on there and see who was above us and give that person a really low number. Is that what you did? <laughs> no, I should have, though, because I lost badly, as always. So it wasn't a cheat, despite the fact that you feel embarrassed about it. So back to the question, how confident were you when you were entering the contest that you could be one of the winners? How much time do you have? <laughs> you were pretty confident, right? Because, I mean, you told your cousin about it, and he was like, oh, oh, that's an awesome movie. What was it, man? I want to go see it. Okay, and yeah, yeah, he wasn't that crazy into it, but he was highly complimentary, and he thought that I was describing a Twilight Zone or, or some movie that I had seen to him. And so that buoyed my confidence a lot. But even if that hadn't happened, I really liked my idea. I thought I had come up with something that at least I responded to greatly. And we've had many conversations, and we will continue to until the Dune Steve ends, about this. How do you know if your story is good or not? Are you guys singing again? (laughs) And I didn't know, but I knew that I liked it. And I guess this is actually a pertinent part of the conversation I'm sorry, we don't have any more time. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone. Good night. The Dune Steve is released under a creative, non commons attribution, no deviations license. Derivation. No deriv...
derivatives, non-commercial. All right, no derivatives. All right, dera- all right dera- announcement. It was just a joke. We weren't really supposed to end. Let's let's move back into the show. Sorry. Time for a smoke. I'm out of here. Okay, so uh, uh, okay, something was pertinent. Well, the the just because I come up with an idea that is good. Let's just uh, pretend for a moment that it's that's unarguably a good idea. How you translate that to the written word and maintain the goodness, maintain that freshness is a real challenge. It is. Because what I had come up with was this big, long backstory for the main character. And then he runs into his sister after all this time. And then he gets a phone call. She says the word. Then he goes and checks on his kids. And they are both evil. And I was like, oh, shoot, how do I tell this story? Do I just start from when they're kids and I go on and, and, and I didn't know. So I did it the way I did where I, it's, it's told in the present tense, not told in the present tense. <laughs> it takes place in the present, but it has Several three flash flashbacks points. and each one is split instead of just, what is it that Abby always calls when you give tons of exposition? Info dump? An info dump. And, and maybe there is an info dump in there. But I tried to split it up in the three ways. Well, there sure was a dump in it. Was that an answer, man? We <laughs> <laughs> didn't sound like something you would say, but he's gone on his smoke break. <laughs> and so it is possible. And, and we've both seen it happen with a movie that has a really good premise and that just, they just blow it yeah. when they're trying to bring it to the screen. Definitely. It is possible that I ruined it by making it too long or by not starting it with him as a kid. You know what I mean? Maybe I, sp- I spelled out too much of what was going on in his childhood. Uh, and so all of the suspense was gone or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, you had me and then you lost me kind of thing. And that's, you know, up to the listener to decide. Uh, chances are because Dave Robison narrated it, you know, that only improved the story. That only oh, made yeah. it stronger. Uh, that guy's voice is awesome. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But if it kills you, no, you'll be then dead. You'll, yeah, you'll be yeah. dead. So there's kind of a, you got to keep that in mind. That's true. Before you huff paint thinner. Um, <laughs> I felt like, oh, this is a really good story. And if I can pull it off, it may not win, but it, a lot of people will respond to it. I'm, I'm glad that, that people liked it. I don't know if you liked it, if you were one of the people that gave it a good score, but we both talked about that so many times. You had this idea for years and years and years about the, the one that we always call the alien, alien, alien love story, I think. We alien love it. story kind of thing. And it's a great idea. I think we both agree on that, but you've had like four or five different ways that it could go. Or, oh, okay. I, I thought maybe it would be better if he's this and she turns out to be this. And then in the end, and you know, I was like, but it's still the same idea, but it's a number of ways you can go. Right. And to me, that's kind of amazing. In the, in the, at least in the writing, uh, in the activity of, of, of writing, you know, just kind, kind of like painting. You know, it's like, I'm going to paint that tree out there and 10 people could paint the same tree and it could look totally different. Yeah. One person does it as a pontulist. The other person does it as like one of those, what is Picasso's style called? Cubist. One of it does a, a cubist. One of them does it realist. One of them does it postmodern. Comes out all crazy, all different ways. Yeah, it's interesting, that whole thing. And it's hard. You know, we've talked about it. I'm trying to think of a, uh, a movie that we mentioned. I know we've at least mentioned one by name where we said, you know, what a great idea that movie was, but not a great movie. It just didn't come out. You know, you watch the trailer for it, and you're like, oh, it's going to be awesome. And then you go and see it, and you're like, oh. Well, one of the very first times that happened to me, and it's probably the most powerful instance, was the the uh, Dennis Quaid, Sean Connery movie Dragonheart. Okay. I saw previews for that, and it it seemed to me that it was going to be like, I can't even imagine what I thought then, because, you know, there's been more time since than before. Uh, that it was going to be like E.T. kind of thing, only a boy and his dragon kind of thing. Or it was like two people that are supposed to be enemies, and then they find out that they have something in common. They become like the best of friends, mm-hmm. despite everybody around them saying, F you guys, you're supposed to be. I, I guess, did you remember Enemy Mine, which also had Dennis Quaid in it? That was about oh, humans were at war with these aliens, and they got marooned on the same planet, and 
they were forced to work together and they became like super close best blood brother friends kind of thing. And I just, I thought, wow, this is going to be really, really good. And I don't know what it was about the trailer, but it made it look like there was going to be a lot more heart to the movie than there was. Dragonheart. Dragonheart, yes. It made it look like there was going to be a lot more Dragonheart than there was. And I went and saw that opening night. I think it was 97 or 96. or Well, I don't know. It wouldn't have been 97. It was right around there, yeah. I saw it uh, pretty early on, too. I saw it opening night. And it, I was so disappointed because they didn't go in that direction a, a, a tiny bit, I guess. I, I haven't seen it since then, but it just bothered me. And I, in my mind, I had built up what I wanted the movie to be, and they didn't do that. And so the first screenplay I ever wrote was how I wanted Dragonheart to be. And I had it a, be about a, a college student and an alien, and they become, you know, best friends. And but then it, Zardoz, dang, I can never remember. Zardoz his name. was another Z, Connery movie. Z Boss was his name, right? It was. And uh, I won a contest. The very first screenwriting contest I ever entered, I won first place for that. And I think it was to be the last screenwriting contest I ever won. I do recall uh, that uh, it was supposed to be a 30 page script and it came out somewhere around 150 pages, if I remember right. Because I wrote a script for that same class. Oh, see, I, I, okay. And mine was terrible, A, and B, 30 pages. <laughs> well, I th- <laughs> thought that the prerequisite was you only had to write 30 pages of the screenplay, and I just wrote the whole damn thing, and then some, because I couldn't control myself. I still can't. <laughs> but anyhow, I just, yeah, that's, that's the example that I always go to. And, you know, if I ever ran into somebody who loved that movie, it would be, an, no, it wouldn't be an interesting conversation. I would despise them. But if I ever ran into the screenwriter, that would be an interesting conversation. The guy or guys who, the very first name who wrote Dragon Heart, I would ask him, hey, the movie that came out in 96 or 97, how close to your movie was that? And what did you originally have in mind? And you know what? They they did like sequels, direct-to-video sequels or prequels or midquels. And squeakles. Uh, squeakle, they did a squeakle. <laughs> and I wonder if any of those examined that. But I, I, it almost seemed like part of the idea of the movie was because dragons and men were mortal enemies, he is ostracized and branded a traitor because he, of his friendship with the dragon. And I don't remember there being any of that in the movie. Um, or, it might even have been that, you know, to prove his worth to humanity, he was going to have to kill that dragon. And I was just like, oh, geez, what would you do kind of thing? And maybe that was in there. I don't know. Do you remember? Well, if I remember it, he was a dragon slayer or something like that. And then uh, instead, because Sean Connery was the last dragon. I am the last one. They somehow forged a friendship because he, he realized. I can't remember really how well how it went, but it was. Maybe he realized that he no longer had a job if he kills this last dragon. I don't remember what. But yeah, then they just started traveling the countryside, bilking people out of stuff by I, saying, I'll kill this dragon and make you safe. And then you just pretend to kill it. And I do remember really liking that part in the middle where they pretend, he pretended to kill it. And he would like shoot a javelin or whatever. And the dragon would catch it in its armpit and go and fall. And everybody go, yay. And then the one time he fell into the lake and the lake was like not really a lake. And so he didn't sink into it. It was like really shallow. And then all the people were like, meat. And they went running out. And then that was when their uh, jig was up. Wow, you really remember That's that. That's all I remember, Good really. For you. I remember there was a hot redheaded chick in that show. Yeah, it was Dina Meyer. She was popular for a couple of years right there. Yeah, she was in Starship Troopers too, wasn't she? She was. Yeah, <laughs> she was the probably the best thing about Starship Troopers, I remember. Probably. She, she was likable, and she died just so that Casper Van Dien could be with Denise Richards at the end. Danger, this conversation has derailed. Yes, derailed. That's right. Uh, may I ask you a question about the calling? Um, Maybe. How is it that I have ended up talking through this whole dang thing? And I, I said I wasn't going to say anything. I knew that you would. All I had to do was just be like steer the conversation towards Rish Outfield and then boom, the dam will break. Well, maybe that's what a good talk show host <laughs> does. He opens up the conversation, finds something that the guest wants to talk about and just lets them shine. But 
when I read your story, there was a specific NFL reference that suddenly tipped the hat <laughs> that said, oh, guess what? Big Enkelvich wrote this. At what point did you know I had written The Calling? Um, to tell you the truth, I was probably the only person that wasn't very objective because I got the stories in the first place and sent them out to everybody. And if I remember right, I had to take the names off of them. Oh, I see. I and thought print she them had out done that. for you and hand you the papers. So I think I, unfortunately, was, there was never a time that I didn't know who did what. Well, that's a question I'll have to cut out. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyways, yeah, that was, that was our last Broken Mirror story. Story. Broken Mirror story event story. I'm sure there will probably come another day when we do another Broken Mirror contest. Right now we've got our other contest going on, being judged as we speak. There were a lot of people that entered that. Yeah. I mean, there were a lot of people that entered the Broken Mirror one, too. But, it took us a long time to judge those. But this new one makes Broken Mirror one look like a drop in the bucket. Except the for these are shorter stories. Yeah, so they will be much shorter story. stories, so I don't think it'll take as long to judge them. but Or um, produce them. Yeah, that'll be good, too. I wonder how many will decide to do in the end. It'll be interesting to find out. But yeah, I'm sure there will be another Broken Mirror Story contest down the line at some point uh, when we get bored enough and maybe things slow down a little bit. It's been a little crazy for me recently, and I'm having a hard time. I feel bad because, for example, uh, a couple episodes ago, The Templar was our episode, and it took me... I mean, like, you gave me... The finished edited episode, and I had the finished edited story, and basically all I had to do was put the two together, which takes like an hour or less to get it all together, and then post it. And it took me like two weeks to finally find enough time to do that. So hopefully here soon, things will slow down a little bit. I think they'll be a little crazy for a while. I'm kind of in the process of moving right now, which is using up all my time and then some, unfortunately. Is it possible that this is the last episode we will record in your kitchen? It's possible because we probably won't record an episode for a few more weeks. Uh, we'll probably be back here next week, so we'll probably do a That Gets My Goat or maybe we'll just hang out and watch a movie. I don't know what we'll do. But yeah, it may well be. I don't know where we'll record for the next little while because oh, that's right. we're having a new house built for us. Our house is sold and there's going to be about two months in between those two so we'll have two months where I don't even know where we're going to be. It'll be interesting. We have the little device, though. That's true. Yeah, we could just sit out in the road and, and do uh, episodes if we wanted to. But eventually, we won't even have to be in the kitchen. We're going to have a whole, like, an actual study in the new house where we can... Maybe I may even be able to leave the microphones hooked up may not have to get them out every week. We'll have to see. I don't know about that. Do you think we should ask people to donate to the show so that we could put those eggshell things on the walls? Yeah, at one point you said, wouldn't it be neat? I wonder how much that would cost. <laughs> and then the second cost came out of your mouth. I saw your spirit deflate. <laughs> I, was just like, oh. I was actually thinking of doing something like that in because the basement will be unfinished. So there'll just be empty area. And I was thinking, I wonder how hard it would be just to put up, you know, just, you know, it wouldn't be finished walls. We could just stick the eggshell stuff all around and then put all that stuff down in the basement in a little corner and we could just record in there. Be interesting. We'll have to see about that. It will just be like a cement walls and floor or it will be more finished than that? It would be just cement walls and floor with like, you know, mostly open. So we'd have to find a corner that has maybe a, part of a, a, a wall you know that you know what the skeleton the frame i guess is what they're called i mean you could staple it onto the frame and that's what your basement looked like before when you first lived here right and now look at it yeah I haven't even had a chance to enjoy it and now it's gone <laughs> it's true but yeah uh we'll have to see but it'll be interesting it'll be fun uh, one way or another but yeah stick with us folks hopefully we'll be able to remain as constant as we ever have through the uh, the t the intervening time, um, so you don't think you'll be able to edit shows or upload shows or stuff during that interim? I should be able to still. I'm sure we're not going to be putting the computer away. 
for good. That'll stay out. But uh, we may not have internet at home, that which will be weird. I'll probably have to do any internet that I need to uh, on my lunch hour at work or something like that. That'll be weird. Yeah. How will we tell people how great Gatsby was? I hadn't considered that. You know what I hadn't considered? Jay-Z songs in a movie that takes place in the 20s. <laughs> what is the deal with that? What is the deal with every historical movie having Jay-Z songs? In the... I think it had something to do with Baz Luhrmann hiring Jay-Z as the musical coordinator for The Great Gatsby. Ah. Oh, wait, how do we get on that? I don't know. Oh, I was saying uh, we didn't actually see The Great Gatsby. I'm not going to see it, so well, there's not going to be an episode for it. Clay Duggar will have an episode about it on the Righteous Dude cast, though. Good, good. Because I'd hate to see it go without an episode. All right. Uh, so do you think we've wound down? Do you have more to say? Anything you want to say about The Calling? Why did you decide on the title The Calling? You know, it wasn't called The Calling. When I was sending it to Dave to read, I couldn't find a file called The Calling. I, just, I, I didn't get it. It was called Chosen on my hard drive. So originally it was called Chosen, and for some reason I changed it to The Calling, and I don't know why. I have no memory of doing that. Huh. Did you feel like Chosen is a better title? It's not like Bear and the Bow changed to Brave, <laughs> is it? <laughs> no. it's uh, They're both equally crappy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the claws come out. <laughs> so does the truth. Uh, no, yeah. I don't it think it is kind does. of a generic title, I guess, but... I mean, you get tethered to the cold and dying, which is just a lovely lyrical title, but it's also nebulous and has nothing to do with the story. So, you know, what's in a name? Yeah, sometimes it's hard. I mean, some stories, an obvious title comes out, you know. I have that. That's the way I am with titles. Usually, if I have a story idea, I'll get a title for it either right away or never. And there's been a few like that where, you know, I, I the story about the baby monitor, I think we've mentioned it on the show at some point. But anyways, there's a baby monitor that... Well, I think we mentioned it in this episode. You said, I'm coming for your son. I did say that. But in another episode, we actually explained the story. We mentioned it and talked about it. But anyways, in that story, you know, that was one of those where I just had no title for it at all. And I, f I sent it to you and you read it and all that stuff. And you're like, well, you ought to come up with a title for it. And then you decided at one point to make a recording of it. And there was still no title for it. And so you just gave it a title and it became The Monitor, which pretty generic again. Uh, but it, I guess it fits the story. But yeah, I, I just couldn't. It didn't have a great title that popped out at me. Whereas other stories, like the idea that I've been mentioning since the start of the year, Sunny and Gray, have a title for it. But no story. Yeah, I haven't even written the story. And I may never, to tell you the truth, but I have a title for it long before I've gotten any further. And there are several stories, a lot of stories that are like that for me. But if I don't get a title right away, I just never do. Never. Just, it usually will never come to me otherwise. And I'll just have to throw something on there like Moonlit Confession. Donate now, and you can listen to Moon Hit Confession with special guest Abby Hilton here in the studio. Yeah, that's just a terrible title, too. I hate it, but... Oh, that's cool. I don't know what else to call it. I mean, uh, I could I'm, just finally... I'm reminded of a, a Broken Mirror story thing that you and I did where there was a revenge crystal. There's somebody buys a, a, a revenge crystal in a shop, uh -huh. and we each had to write a story of what would happen if somebody did that. And we both called our stories the same thing. And it was just like, it was, whoa. Do, 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 it was do, do. almost the same. If I remember right, mine was called Served Cold and yours was called Cold, cold served, served or something like that. It yeah, was Cold Served with a hyphen. But I mean, still, that's the same title. Yeah. And I, it's obvious, I guess, because it's a story about revenge. But when I saw that, I was, I was so <laughs> delighted that we'd both come up yeah. with that. I went oh, Someday we need to publish those. Just I changed so people the title of my story, though, so nobody will realize it's the same one. Oh, that's right. Tethered to the Cold and Dying. Yeah. No. It, uh, it had a title like that, though. I think it's called Black Angel now. Yeah. But was it called the Black Angel? Because at one point he says, I am the angel of death. I am the... What is it he says? I am the... Black Angel of whatever, something or other, which is where it came from. That's a cool title. I like Black Angel. I think it was called Black Angel. Uh, I but but I, I prefer 
Asian angels, <laughs> but still. You must go there, mustn't you? I'm probably going to have to cut all that out, but <laughs> Wendy will like it. Well, you got me talking. And see, that's a weird thing. I don't know if all writers are like that. Abby certainly is like that, though. You get them talking about their writing, and they can go on and on. Because it's just, I mean, something that we think about all the time. And But we, so rarely do you have somebody that gives a crap. Because, <laughs> you know, it's an internal struggle and some, you know, you're weighing and it's like, oh gosh, I couldn't decide whether I was going to let James live or, or die. And so I decided, the undead. Yes, I would have my James and eat him too. And I, mm. I, but, uh, you never have anybody that cares about that. So because it's like sausage making or laws <laughs> passing, nobody wants to know how these things are made. They just want to enjoy the finished product. And, uh, I, I I can't wait to talk about whatever story is cur- currently going on, and and you have your own podcast where you do that. I mean, that's not all you talk about. You talk about running and trying to get your ch- wife with a male child, and and it's never going to happen, dang it. and things like that. But you also <laughs> will say, you know, I, I I got this idea, and it came to me while I was running, and I, the friggin' car broke down yet again, and I was able to ride it whilst waiting for them to not fix my car, and. <laughs> I don't know. That's just something for me. It's, it's fun to talk about and ask. And that's, you know, I wanted to ask these people the questions about the story, not because I wanted you to ask me. I, I was kind of mortified when I had to answer the same three questions, <laughs> but because we had done broken mirrors twice before on this show. And I always wondered, did, was this an idea that had been kicking around in their heads before? And we gave them the opportunity to tell the story. Or did they just cheat? And it was a story that they wrote in the sixth grade and they changed one word so that it would fit into the contest parameters and all that stuff. And we'd never been able to ask them. So I just came up with this, these three questions thing so that we would find the definitive answer unless, you know, they lied like Muncie did on all of them. (laughs) Yes. That's all I have to say. (laughs) Just yes. (laughs) You know, you know what you ought to do? I mean, I've got the ankle cast. Now you've got yourself a Zoom H1 as well. You should start the Rish Outcast. Oh, that's not bad. <laughs> and you can do a similar thing where you talk to people about your story ideas. I could even show you how to put it up yourself so you won't have to depend on me. And uh, you could have your your own podcast where you talk about your struggles of writing and so I mean that was that the sad thing is that was supposed to be my point was me to document and talk about writing and have people on my case so that I would write more and people be like hey you talked about this story and where the hell is it you suck mother and stuff none of that talk now oh, oh he's back sorry announcer man I didn't realize you were back I should have sworn more while you were gone but, you know, I mean, that was the point, and it's devolved into me just giving my weekly report of, I ran this far this week, and I didn't write at all this week. The end. Well, do you have people listen to AnkleCast that give a shit whether you run or not? <laughs> Probably not. But you do have people that care whether you're writing or not. I think so. I, I mean, remember they... somebody on there saying, hey, well, how's Sunny and Gray going? Yeah, some people have mentioned it, and I've made excuses. The, unfortunately, this whole moving thing is just sucking away all time that i have but you could ankle cast about how your contest story went that's true i I know you wrote that i have been uh, and you wrote wrote another story before the balloon thing Mm -hmm. yeah you know what i uh, i was thinking of doing too is just taking some of these really short stories and just reading them as part of the ankle cast i had to do that sometimes people would love that man and yeah you mentioned a rich outcast that's really clever (laughs) i do have my own podcast but it's I have so much crap that I edit and stuff. I've got two episodes recorded of that that nobody has ever heard because I they're so low on the priority list. They are below sea level. They're below, they're eight below with, uh, what's that name of that guy that my sister doesn't like? Paul Walker. I'm sorry. I, 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 I Two roads diverged and I took the really, really crappy one. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it would be fun. And I, I have done... An episode or two where I read one of my stories and then I talk about how it came to be. But that always feels so self-serving. I, 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 and nobody ever comments on those episodes either. Do you, There's no do you, place for them to comment on it, is there? Do you hate it when people don't comment on your 
Well, obviously I would like comments, but it's not necessarily for that. I mean, it would help if people would especially, you know, give me encouraging comments. But the good thing about the ankle cast and what you could do with the Rish Outcast is I don't edit it. I basically just say it. And spray it. And when it's done, I just put it out. Say it and play it. That's right. The only time I've ever edited was one time I had to do it in several sittings because you gave me a huge list of questions that I had to answer. And it took more than just my drive to work. It took my drive to work. And then I think I had to drive to my sister's house to drop off the kid. And then I stopped there. And then I started back up and drove all the way to work. And then I stopped there. And then I drove to like Carl's Jr. for lunch or something like that. And then I stopped when I got there. And then I finished it up on the way back. And work. I think there was a, a point where you pressed record, it didn't record, you had to do it again. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I did do that once too where I was thought I was recording. I'd, I'd finished the show and then I went, what? It wasn't recording? Ah! And I started over. Um, but yeah, that one, there wasn't actually editing. The only editing was assembling them all into one file. But yeah, you know, you could do that easily um, as long as you could manage to control yourself and not, you know shout racist slogans or any of that kind of stuff that you usually do that we usually edit out you know <laughs> i don't like the dutch i just i don't all that kind of stuff if you could manage then you could just put it out and you wouldn't have to worry about editing and it wouldn't matter what priority it had you just level eight noise reduce and go the hole in that is i'm always terrified of sharing my stories with people because you say it with me, kids. What if they said they were no good? <laughs> what if they said, get out of here, kid? You've got no future. I don't think. You could take that kind of rejection? Exactly. Well, maybe if you just talked about your ideas to start with, you said, yeah, here's my idea, and it's going to be like this, and then people would comment and say, whoa, that's a great idea. What is it from? Is that an episode of The Twilight Zone? <laughs> And then that you'll be was like, high praise. You know how good that made me feel? <laughs> you'll be like, whoa, people really like this. I'm going to share it on the show. And uh, yeah, I actually had a story where I was this close to doing a whole production of it because I wrote a story and you talking about the always having the football reference, although that was probably cut out of the show. But anyways, um, I did a whole story about a post-apocalyptic does that, I guess it counts as post Basically, the world was destroyed and people had to retreat underground into like caverns and they steadily rediscovered all the things that, you know, they once had when they were still living on the surface and they finally rediscovered football and a football league was redone. And I did a whole story about this re found, uh, football league and they they had their super bowl and etc cetera, etc cetera, and i was going to read this story and put it out on my ankle cast especially for the super bowl because i came across the story like the weekend that the super bowl was happening and i went oh this would be really cool i could put it out for the super bowl and i was like oh, super bowl's like tomorrow <laughs> it's not gonna happen in time and so i just figured i'd save it till next year or something like that but but you were going to produce it or are you just going to read it straight through i was Probably just going to read it straight through, maybe a little producing. I don't know what I was planning, but uh, I didn't figure even if I just read it straight through, I'd have time to edit out all my screw-ups in time. So I gave up on that idea. But yeah, I think I may do that. The other thing that I was thinking is that, you know, just throwing those same stories that we talked about, the balloon story, and... Spoon Man! No, there wasn't a Spoon Man story. Oh, the Rainbow Man story. I was thinking about throwing both of those just on to the docket for the uh, Dune Steve audio fiction magazine and putting them out in such a manner. Yeah, I was trying to figure out I was going to have you read them and tell me if they were good, but you said you wouldn't be able to be honest and say, you know what? Uh, no. So that's hard to... because I can't take rejection very well and I don't want to put others through that I, I i think i've toughened up a little bit being an editor for this show um in giving others rejection but <laughs> you know thank goodness we don't i thank goodness nicole sends those rejection letters out because i i wouldn't want to have to do that 
you know, and it's sometime, I think we've talked about it just on an episode recently, or maybe that gets my goat or something that you hadn't hit record. It's that same <laughs> Zoom, how many times it has screwed us, I don't know. But we're talking about, I mean, do they always have to be produced? Sometimes it's awesome to go, just go to a, a bookstore and an author is there and they just read a story of theirs. Or, or you know, we've all been to symposia <laughs> when an author gets up and they just read one of their works or they read an excerpt. And it's sometimes it's riveting, dude, even though there's no music and there's no voice cast or any of that stuff. It's just the author and their work. And so, yeah, maybe if I had an outcast and your ankle cast or whatever, it would be acceptable. Just, okay, I'm going to read this story that I wrote from beginning to end. And then I'm going to talk about where it came from. That sounds exciting. It sounds passable. I, I mean, we could even do a couple of dune like that, where it's just you and me anyway. And we're like, yeah, you know what? We're recording this on Monday. We're going to put it up on Thursday or Wednesday or whatever. We're not going to edit it just to see what the audience thinks of a really raw episode you know I, and and not all stories work that way because i i've as i've experienced being a making quotes in the air professional audiobook narrator you can make quotes in the air <laughs> all right uh, there are some stories that work better with the full cast because there's a ton of characters or or you know I'm just not talented enough to give dialects to nine different male characters or whatever, you know? And then there are some where, oh, yeah, it's fine with just one reader. So I, that is an, I, that's a cool idea. I, I, I don't know if I'll ever do it. It's one of those where I'm, I'm all hyped up whilst talking to you, but during the drive, you know, the doubts will creep Record in. Record it during the drive, then. Come on, man. That's what I do. But it's hard to read a story while you're driving. I suppose so, but you could record the other part while you're driving. Okay, well, hey, we put it out there. Have uh, It was one of those things. Maybe people can bug us about it. Sure. If you would listen to a Rish Outcast as well, you know, the same way that you guys have embraced and love the Angle Cast. Oh, no one has done either of those things. Oh, darn it. Okay, well, if you would listen. They have healthily handshaken and tolerated the ankle cast. <laughs> if you would listen to a Rish outcast in the opposite way of that, that you have ignored the ankle cast, <laughs> then comment on the show and let Rish know. Encourage him to actually do it. He should, because he's got way more to say than I do. That's for sure. That's awful, isn't it? <laughs> well, you've got like a bajillion stories just sitting there waiting to be used. And, you know, if you had a, a way like this that you could just put them out, you don't even have to have a story every episode. I have no stories yet, but, uh, you know, if you had a way to throw them out there all quick and fast, dude, for once somebody would know about all these stories instead of them just being get, gathering dust at the bottom of your hard drive where they are now. So comment on that, folks. Encourage Rish Outfield to put his stuff out there for public consumption. It was hard enough for me to put this one out. Although I've, we've got some down the line that people are producing that have our names on them. That's right. And so at some point, it's got to get easier, right? I would think so, yeah. The more you do it, the easier it is. When we first started this show, I sucked. I could barely string two words together while standing in front of a microphone. And uh, now I can string three words together. So there you go. You heard it here first, folks. No. Help me out. What was it? How do I respond to something like that? Here, here. <clears throat> uh, okay, well, is, it feels like the end. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we've run our course. The Broken Mirror Contest 2011 <laughs> is finally closing its doors. And uh, thank you for everybody that entered the contest and judged the contest and have listened to these episodes. And again... We are planning on doing another one, but it might take a little encouragement from y'all. So if you want another Broken Mirror, say so. I want to thank Dave Robison for narrating that. The funny thing is I, I was worried because I'd only heard him on the Roundtable podcast as a, a moderator kind of thing. Yeah, like a host. As a host, yeah, himself. sorry. 
Um, and he had a really cool voice. And I was like, oh, gosh, that guy sounds like a he's got a, a DJ voice. You know, I was like, coming up the new hit by 38 special. Of course, he doesn't sound anything like that voice I just did. He but more like Casey Case. He's like, that's right. Keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. There you go. You even ra- drew out stars like he did. <laughs> and I knew he had a great voice, but I didn't know if he could act. And it does take acting talent to perform a story rather than just read a story. But I, I, I shouldn't have doubted. I've heard the guy read uh, on Journey Into. I heard him on Way of the Buffalo. I heard him on like one of the big ones, uh, the Escape Artist thing. It might have been Pod Castle, but it could even have been an Escape Pod. And that guy's voice is just awesome. He should be doing what I do. But, you know, just with a quality microphone. <laughs> and yeah, I, I don't know that I would ever work again if Dave ever decided to professionally narrate audiobooks. Probably true. So thanks, Dave, for uh, reading that for us. Awesome stuff. Hope everybody enjoyed the show. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next time. I'm Big Anklevich. I'm not going to say anything this episode. Oh. Okay, well, that was Rish Outfield. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks for listening. Rish, you've become a half-human, half-monster abomination. The good news is that you're that much closer to becoming a full-fledged human being. Please, press the button and donate. Thanks. The Doonstief is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. Take two. Are you still a little loud? Let me turn it down again. Hold on. Weird that it would be so loud. Oops, no. Is there something different than we usually use? Or has it just been so many months since we did an episode that I can't remember what your I, hearing has come back? Yeah, I may have kept. I mean, I I may have always kept it on ten with these mics. They're just good, I guess. I don't know. They make that crap you use on your audiobooks sound like <laughs> crap. Oh yeah, it makes them sound <laughs> like what they are. Are these the Scott Pig microphones? Yes. Someday when we've built up enough money, we'll get you one of these for your home. You know what would be really cool is when I have a new home and we don't have to record at the kitchen table anymore. But we will. <laughs> yeah, we'll just do it more. <laughs> With we'll just fancy have a, Dijon a ketchups. bigger table. Search your feelings. You know it to be true. No, that's not true. That's impossible! You can destroy the Emperor. It is your destiny. Join me and together we can end this destructive conflict and bring order to the galaxy. Alright, let's give it a shot.